Matthew Henry's Commentary on the Whole Bible Joshua 22 Many particular things we have read concerning the two tribes and a half, though nothing separated them from the rest of the tribes except the river Jordan, and this chapter is wholly concerning them. 1. Joshua's dismission of the militia of those tribes from the camp of Israel, in which they had served as auxiliaries, during all the wars of Canaan, and their return thereupon to their own country, verses 1-9. 2. The altar they built on the borders of Jordan in token of their communion with the land of Israel, verse 10. 3. The offense which the rest of the tribes took at this altar, and the message they sent thereupon, thereupon verses 11 to 20. 4. The apology which the two tribes and a half made for what they had done, verses 21 to 29. 5. The satisfaction which their apology gave to the rest of the tribes, verses 30 to 34. And, which is strange, whereas in most differences that happen there is a fault on both sides, on this there was fault on no side, none, for aught that appears, were to be blamed, but all to be praised. The Reubenites, Gadites, and half tribe of Manasseh dismissed, 1444 BC. 1 Then Joshua called the Reubenites, and the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, too, and said unto them, Ye have kept all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. 3 Ye have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. For and now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren, as he promised them, therefore now return ye, and get you unto your tents, and unto the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side Jordan. 5 But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law, which Moses the servant of the Lord charged you, to love the Lord your God, and to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, and to cleave unto him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. 6 So Joshua blessed them, and sent them away, and they went unto their tents. 7 Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh Moses had given possession in Bashan, but unto the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side Jordan westward. And when Joshua sent them away also unto their tents, then he blessed them, eight, and he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents, and with very much cattle, with silver, and with gold, and with brass, and with iron, and with very much raiment, divide the spoil, the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. 9 And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned, and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go unto the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, whereof they were possessed, according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. The war being ended, and ended gloriously, Joshua, as a prudent general, disbands his army, who never designed to make war their trade, and sends them home, to enjoy what they had conquered, and to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and particularly the forces of these separate tribes, who had received their inheritance on the other side Jordan from Moses upon this condition, that their men of war should assist the other tribes in the conquest of Canaan, which they promised to do, Numbers 32 verse 32, and renewed the promise to Joshua at the opening of the campaign, Joshua 1 verse 16. And, now that they had performed their bargain, Joshua publicly and solemnly in Shiloh gives them their discharge. Whether this was done, as it was placed, not till after the land was divided, as some think, or whether after the war was ended, and before the division was made, as others think, because there was no need of their assistance in dividing the land, but only in conquering it, nor were there any of their tribes employed as commissioners in that affair, but only of the other ten, Numbers 34 verse 18, etc. This is certain, it was not done till after Shiloh was made the headquarters, verse 2, and the land was begun to be divided before they removed from Gilgal, chapter 14 verse 6. It is probable that this army of Reubenites and Gadites, which had led the van in all the wars of Canaan, had sometimes, in the intervals of action, and when the rest of the army retired into winter quarters, some of them at least, made a step over Jordan, for it was not far, to visit their families, and to look after their private affairs, and perhaps tarried at home, and sent others in their room more serviceable. But still these two tribes and a half had their quota of troops ready, forty thousand. In all, which, whenever there was occasion, presented themselves at their respective posts, and now attended in a body to receive their discharge. Though their affection to their families and concern for their affairs, could not but make them, after so long an absence, 
very desirous to return, yet, like good soldiers, they would not move till they had orders from their general. So, though our Heavenly Father's house above be ever so desirable, it is Bishop Hall's illusion, yet must we stay on earth till our warfare be accomplished, wait for a due discharge, and not anticipate the time of our, our removal. 1. Joshua dismisses them to the land of their possession, verse 4. Those that were first in the assignment of their lot were last in the enjoyment of it, they got the start of their brethren in title, but their brethren were before them in full possession, so the last shall be first, and the first last, that there may be something of equality. 2. He dismisses them with their pay, for who goes a warfare at his own charge? Return with much riches unto your tents, verse 8. Though all the land they had helped to conquer was to go to the other tribes, yet they should have their share of the plunder, and had so, and this was all the pay that any of the soldiers expected, for the wars of Canaan bore their own charges. Go, says Joshua, go home to your tents, that is, your houses, which he calls tents, because they had been so much used to tents in the wilderness, and indeed the strongest and stateliest houses in this world are to be looked upon, but as tents, mean and movable in comparison with our house above. Go home with much riches, not only cattle, the spoil of the country, but silver and gold, the plunder of the cities, and one. one. Let your brethren whom you leave behind have your good word, who have allowed you your share in full, though the land is entirely theirs, and have not offered to make any drawback. Do not say that you are losers by us. 2. Let your brethren whom you go to, who abode by the stuff, have some share of the spoil, divide the spoil with your brethren, as that was divided which was taken in the war with Midian, Numbers 31 colon 27. Let your brethren that have wanted you all this will be the better for you when you come home. 3. He dismisses them with a very honorable character. Though their service was a due debt, and the performance of a promise, and they had done no more than was their duty to do, yet he highly commends them, not only gives them up their bonds, as it were, now that they had fulfilled the condition, but applauds their good services. Though it was by the favor of God and his power that Israel got possession of this land, and he must have all the glory, yet Joshua thought there was a thankful acknowledgment due to their brethren who assisted them, and whose sword and bow were employed for them. God must be chiefly eyed in our praises, yet instruments must not be altogether overlooked. He here commends them, 1. For the readiness of their obedience to their commanders, verses 2. When Moses was gone, they remembered and observed the charge he had given them, and all the orders which Joshua, as general of the forces, had issued out, they had carefully obeyed, went and came and did, as he appointed, Matthew 8 verse 9. It is as much as anything the soldiers praise to observe the word of command. 2. For the constancy of their affection and adherence to their brethren, you have not left them these many days. How many days he does not say, nor can we gather it with certainty from any other place. Calvisius and others of the best chronologers compute that the conquering and dividing of the land was the work of about six or seven years, and so long these separate tribes attended their camp, and did them the best service they could. Note, it will be the honor of those that have espoused the cause of God's Israel, and twisted interests with them, to adhere to them, and never to leave them till God has given them rest, and then they shall rest with them. 3. For the faithfulness of their obedience to the divine law. They had not only done their duty to Joshua and Israel, but which was be best of all, they had made conscience of their duty to God, you have kept the charge, or, as the word is, you have kept the keeping, that is, you have carefully and circumspectly kept the commandment of the Lord your God, not only in this particular instance of continuing in the service of Israel to the end of the war, but, in general, you have kept up religion in your part of the camp, a rare and excellent thing among soldiers, and where it is worthy to be praised. For he dismisses them with good counsel, not to cultivate their ground, fortify their cities, and, now that their hands were inured to war and victory, to invade their neighbors, and so enlarge their own territories, but to keep up serious godliness among them and the power of it. They were not political but pious instructions that he gave them, verse 5. 1. In general, to take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law. Those that have the commandment have it in vain, unless they do the commandment, and it will not be done aright, so apt are we to turn aside, and so industrious are our spiritual enemies to turn us aside, unless we take heed, diligent heed. 2. In particular, to love the Lord our God, as the best of beings, beings, and the best of friends, 
and as far as this principle rules in the heart, and is the spring of its pulses, there will be a constant care and sincere endeavor to walk in his ways, in all his ways, even those that are narrow and uphill, in every particular instance, in all manner of conversation to keep his commandments, at all times and in all conditions with purpose of heart to cleave unto him, and to serve him, and his honor. And the interest of his kingdom among men, with all our heart, and with all our soul. What good counsel was here given to them is given to us all. God give us grace to take it. 5. He dismisses them with a blessing, verse 6, particularly the half-tribe of Manasseh, to which Joshua, as an Ephraimite, was somewhat nearer akin than to the other two, and who perhaps were the more loath to depart because they left one half of their own tribe behind them, and therefore, bidding often farewell, and lingering behind, had a second dismission and blessing, verse 7. Joshua not only prayed for them as a friend, but blessed them as a father in the name of the Lord, recommending them, their families, and affairs, to the grace of God. Some by the blessing Joshua gave them understand the presence he made them, in recompense of their services, but Joshua being a prophet, and having given them one part of a prophet's reward in the instructions he gave them, verse 5, no doubt we must understand this of the other, even the prayers he made for them, as one having authority, and as God's vicegerent. 6. Being thus dismissed, they returned to the land of their possession in a body, verse 9, ferry boats being, it is likely, provided for their repassing Jordan. Though masters of families may sometimes have occasion to be absent, long absent, from their families, yet, when their business abroad is finished, they must remember home is their place, from which they ought not to wander as a bird from her nest. The Altar of the Reubenites, 1444 BC. 10 And when they came unto the borders of Jordan, that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see to. 11 And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan, in the borders of Jordan, at the passage of the children of Israel. 12 And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh, to go up to war against them. 13 And the children of Israel sent unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead, Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest, 14, and with him ten princes, of each chief house a prince throughout all the tribes of Israel, and each one was a head of the house of their fathers among the thousands of Israel. 15 And they came unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead, and they spake with them, saying, 16 Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord, in that ye have builded you an altar, that ye might rebel this day against the Lord? 17 Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we are not cleansed until this day? although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, 18, but that ye must turn away this day from fo following the Lord? And it will be, seeing ye rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow, he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. 19 Notwithstanding, if the land of your possession be unclean, then pass ye over unto the land of the possession of the Lord, wherein the Lord's tabernacle dwelleth, and take possession among us, but rebel not against the Lord nor rebel against us, in building you an altar beside the altar of the Lord our God. 20 Did not Achan the son of Zerah commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel? And that man perished not alone in his iniquity. Here is, 1. The pious care of the separated tribes to keep their hold of Canaan's religion, even when they were leaving Canaan's land, that they might not be as the sons of the stranger, utterly separated from God's people, Isaiah 56 verse 3. In order to this, they built a great altar on the borders of Jordan, to be a witness for them that they were Israelites, and as such partakers of the altar of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 18. When they came to Jordan, verse 10, they did not consult how to preserve the remembrance of their own exploits in the wars of Canaan, and the services they had done their brethren, by erecting a monument to the immortal honor of the two tribes and a half but their relation to the Church of God, together with their interest in the communion of saints, is that which they are solicitous to preserve and perpetuate the proofs and evidences of, and therefore without delay, when the thing was first proposed by some among them, who, though glad to think that they were going towards home, 
were sorry to think that they were going from the altar of God, immediately they erected this altar, which served as a bridge to keep up their fellowship with the other tribes in the things of God. Some think they built this altar on the Canaan side of Jordan, in the lot of Benjamin, that, looking over the river, they might see the figure of the altar at Shiloh, when they could not conveniently go to it, but it is more likely that they built it on their own side of the water, for what had they to do to build on another man's land without his consent? And it is said to be over against the land of Canaan, nor would there have been any cause of suspecting it designed for sacrifice if they had not built it among themselves. This altar was very innocently and honestly designed, but it would have been well if, since it had in it an appearance of evil, and might be an occasion of offense to their brethren, they had consulted the oracle of God about it before they did it, or at least acquainted their brethren with their purpose, and given them the same explication of their altar before, to prevent their jealousy, which they did afterwards, to remove it. Their zeal was commendable, but it ought to have been guided with discretion. There was no need to hasten the building of an altar for the purpose for which they intended this, but they might have taken time to consider and take advice, yet, when their sincerity was made to appear, we do not find that they were blamed for their rashness. God does, and men should, overlook the weakness of an honest zeal. 2. The holy jealousy of the other tribes for the honor of God and his altar at Shiloh. Notice was immediately brought to the princes of Israel of the setting up of this altar, verse 11. And they, knowing how strict and severe that law was which required them to offer all their sacrifices in the place which God should choose, and not elsewhere, Deuteronomy 12 verses 5 to 7, were soon apprehensive that the setting up of another altar was an affront to the choice which God had lately made of a place to put his name in, and had a direct tendency to the worship of some other god. Now. 1. Their suspicion was very excusable, for it must be confessed the thing, prima facie at first sight looked ill, and seemed to imply a design to set up and maintain a competitor with the altar at Shiloh. It was, no, it was no strained innuendo from the building of an altar to infer an intention to offer sacrifice upon it, and that might introduce idolatry and end in a total apostasy from the faith and worship of the God of Israel. So great a matter might this fire kindle. God is jealous for his own institutions, and therefore we should be so too, and afraid of everything that looks like, or leads to, idolatry. 2. Their zeal, upon this suspicion, was very commendable, verse 12. When they apprehended that these tribes, which by the river Jordan were separated from them, were separating themselves from God, they took it as the greatest injury that could be done to themselves, and showed a readiness, if it were necessary, to put their lives in their hands in defense of the altar of God, and to take up arms for the chastising and reducing of these rebels, and to prevent the spreading of the infection, if no gentler methods would serve, by cutting off from their body the gangrened member. They all gathered together, and Shiloh was the place of their rendezvous, because it was in defense of the divine charter lately granted to that place that they now appeared, their resolution was as became a kingdom of priests, who, being devoted to God in his service, did not acknowledge their brethren nor know their own children, Deuteronomy 33 verse 9. They would immediately go up to war against them if it appeared they had revolted from God, and were in rebellion against him. Though they were bone of their bone, had been companions with them in tribulation in the wilderness, and serviceable to them in the wars of Canaan, yet, if they turn to serve other gods, gods, they will treat them as enemies, not as sons of Israel, but as children of whoredoms, for so God had appointed, Deuteronomy 13 verse 12, etc. They had but lately sheathed their swords, and retired from the perils and fatigues of war to the rest God had given them, and yet they are willing to begin a new war rather than be any way wanting in their duty to restrain, repress, and revenge, idolatry, and every step towards it a brave resolution, and which shows them hearty for their religion, and, we hope, careful and diligent in the practice of it themselves. Corruptions in religion are best dealt with at first, before they get head and plead prescription. 3. Their prudence in the prosecution of this zealous resolution is no less commendable. God had appointed them, in cases of this nature, to inquire and make search, Deuteronomy 13 verse 14, that they might not wrong their brethren under pretense of writing their religion, accordingly they resolve here not to send forth their armies, to wage war, till they had first sent their ambassadors to inquire into the merits of the cause, and these men of the first rank, one out of each tribe, and Phinehas at the head of them to be their spokesman, verses 13 and 14. Thus was their zeal for God tempered, guided, and governed by the meekness of wisdom. He that knows all things, and hates all evil things, 
would not punish the worst of criminals, but he would first go down and see, Genesis 18 verse 21. Many an unhappy strife would be prevented, or soon healed by an impartial and favorable inquiry into that which is the matter of the offense. The rectifying of mistakes and misunderstandings, and the setting of mis misconstrued words and actions in a true light, would be the most effectual way to accommodate both private and public quarrels, and bring them to a happy period. For the ambassador's management of this matter came fully up to the sense and spirit of the congregation concerning it, and bespeaks much both of zeal and prudence. 1. The charge they draw up against their brethren is indeed very high, and admits no other excuse than that it was in their zeal for the honor of God, and was now intended to justify the resentments of the congregation at Shiloh, and to awaken the supposed delinquents to clear themselves, otherwise they might have suspended their judgment, or mollified it at least, and not have taken it for granted, as they, as they do here, verse 16, that the building of this altar was a trespass against the God of Israel, and a trespass no less heinous than the revolt of soldiers from their captain, you turn from following the Lord, and the rebellion of subjects against their sovereign, that you might rebel this day against the Lord. Hard words. It is well they were not able to make good their charge. Let not innocency think it strange to be thus misrepresented and accused. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. 2. The aggravation of the crime charged upon their brethren is somewhat far-fetched. Is the iniquity of P or too little for us? Verse 17. Probably that is mentioned because Phinehas, the first commissioner in this treaty, had signalized himself in that matter, Numbers 25 verse 7, and because we may suppose they were not about the very place in which that iniquity was committed on the other side Jordan. It is good to recollect and improve those instances of the wrath of God, revealed from heaven against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, which have fallen out in our own time, and which we ourselves have been eyewitnesses of. He reminds them of the iniquity of Peor, 1. As a very great sin, and very provoking to God. The building of this altar seemed but a small matter, but it might lead to an iniquity as bad as that of Peor, and therefore must be crushed in its first rise. Note, the remembrance of great sins committed formerly should engage us to stand upon our guard against the least occasions and beginnings of sin, for the way of sin is downhill. 2. As a sin that the whole congregation had smarted for, there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, of which, in one day, there died no fewer than twenty-four thousand, was not that enough forever to warn you against idolatry? What? Will you bring upon yourselves another plague? Are you so mad upon an idolatrous altar that you will run yourselves thus upon the sword's point of God's judgments? Does not our camp still feel from that sin and the punishment of it? We are not cleansed from it unto this day. There are remaining sparks, first, of the infection of that sin, some among us so inclined to idolatry, that if you set up another altar they will soon take occasion from that, whether you intend it or no, to worship another god. Secondly, of the wrath of God against us for that sin. We have reason to fear that, if we provoke God by another sin to, to visit, he will remember against us the iniquity of Peor, as he threatened to do that of the golden calf, Exodus 32 verse 34. And dare you wake the sleeping lion of divine vengeance? Note, it is a foolish and dangerous thing for people to think their former sins little, too little for them, as those do who had sin to sin, and so treasure up wrath against the day of wrath. Let therefore the time past suffice, 1 Peter 4 verse 3. 3. The reason they give for their concerning themselves so warmly in this matter is very sufficient. They were obliged to it, in their own necessary defense, by the law of self-preservation, for, if you revolt from God today, who knows but tomorrow his judgments may break in upon the whole congregation, verse 18, as in the case of a can. Verse 20. He sinned, and we all smarted for it, by which we should receive instruction, and from what God did then infer what he may do, and fear what he will do, if we do not witness against your sin, who are so many, and punish it. Note, the conservators of the public peace are obliged, in justice to the common safety, to use their power for the restraining and suppressing of vice and profaneness, lest, if it be connived at, the sin thereby become national and bring God's judgments upon the community. Nay, we are all concerned to reprove our neighbor when he does amiss, lest we bear sin for him, Leviticus 19 verse 17. 4. 
The offer they make is very fair and kind, verse 19, that if they thought the land of their possession unclean, for want of an altar, and therefore could not be easy without one, rather than they should set up another, another in competition with that at Shiloh they should be welcome to come back to the land where the Lord's tabernacle was, and settle there, and they would very willingly straighten themselves to make room for them. By this they showed a sincere and truly pious zeal against schism, that rather than their brethren should have any occasion to set up a separate altar, though their pretense for it, as here supposed, was very weak and grounded upon a great mistake, yet they were willing to part with a considerable share of the land which God himself had by the lot assigned them, to comprehend them, and take them in among them. This was the spirit of Israelites indeed. 21 Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered, and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, 22 The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know, if it be in rebellion, or if in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day, 23 That we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering, or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it, 24 And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying, In time to come your children might speak unto our children, saying, What have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? 25 For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. 26 Therefore we said, Let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice. 27 But that it may be a witness between us, and you, and our generations after us, that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, and with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come, Ye have no part in the Lord. 28 Therefore said we, that it, sh it shall be, when they should so say to us, or to our generations in time to come, that we may say again, Behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. 29 God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord, and turn this day from following the Lord, to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings, or for sacrifices, beside the altar of the Lord our God that is before his tabernacle. We may suppose there was a general convention called of the princes and great men of the separate tribes, to give audience to these ambassadors, or perhaps the army, as it came home, was still encamped in a body, and not yet dispersed, however it was, there were enough to represent the two tribes and a half, and to give their sense. Their reply to the warm remonstrance of the ten tribes is very fair and ingenuous. They do not retort their charge, upbraid them with the injustice and unkindness of their threatenings, nor reproach them for their rash and hasty censures, but give them a soft answer which turns away wrath, avoiding all those grievous words which stir up anger, they demur not to their jurisdiction, nor plead that they were not accountable to them for what they had done, nor bid them mind their own business, but, by a free and open declaration of their sincere intention in what they did, free themselves from the imputation they were under, and set themselves right in the opinion of their brethren, to do which they only needed to state the case, and put the matter in a true light. 1. One, they solemnly protest against any design to use this altar for sacrifice or offering, and therefore were far from setting it up in competition with the altar at Shiloh, or from entertaining the least thought of deserting that. They had indeed set up that which had the shape and fashion of an altar, but they had not dedicated it to a religious use, had had no solemnity of its consecration, and therefore ought not to be charged with a design to put it to any such use. To gain credit to this protestation here is 1. A solemn appeal to God concerning it, with which they begin their defense, intending thereby to give glory to God first, and then to give satisfaction to their brethren. Verse 22. 1. A profound awe and reverence of God are expressed in the form of their appeal, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows. Or, as it might be read somewhat closer to the original, the God of gods, Jehovah, the God of gods, Jehovah, he knows, which bespeaks his self-existence and self-sufficiency, he is Jehovah, and has sovereignty and supremacy over all beings and powers whatsoever, even those that are called gods, or that are worshipped. This brief confession of their faith would help to obviate and remove their brethren's suspicion of them, as if they intended to desert the God of Israel, and worship other gods, how could those entertain such a thought who believed him to be God over all? Let us learn hence always to speak of God with reverence and seriousness, 
and to mention his name with a solemn pause. Those who make their appeals to heaven with a slight, careless, God knows, have reason to fear lest they take his name in vain, for it is very unlike this appeal. 2. It is a great confidence of their own integrity which they express in the matter of their appeal. They refer the controversy to the God of gods, whose judgment, we are sure, is according to truth, such as the guilty have reason to dread and the upright to rejoice in. If it be in rebellion or transgression that we have built this altar, to confront the altar of the Lord at Shiloh, to make a party, or to set up any new gods or worships, one. He knows it, verse 22, for he is perfectly acquainted with the thoughts and intents of the heart, and particularly with all inclinations to idolatry, Psalm 44 verses 20 and 21, this is in a particular manner before him. We believe he knows it, and we cannot by any arts conceal it from him. 2. Let him require it, as we know, know he will, for he is a jealous God. Nothing but a clear conscience would have thus imprecated divine justice to avenge the rebellion if there had been any. Note, first, in everything we do in religion, it highly concerns us to approve ourselves to God in our integrity therein, remembering that he knows the heart. Secondly, when we fall under the censures of men, it is very comfortable to be able with a humble confidence to appeal to God concerning our sincerity. See 1 Corinthians 4 verses 3 and 4. 2. A sober apology presented to their brethren, Israel, he shall know. Though the record on high, and the witness in our bosoms, are principally to be made sure for us, yet there is a satisfaction besides which we owe to our brethren who doubt concerning our integrity, and which we should be ready to give with meekness and fear. If our sincerity be known to God, we should study likewise to let others know it by its fruits, especially those who, though they mistake us, yet show a zeal for the glory of God, as the ten tribes here did. 3. A serious abjuration or renunciation of the design which they were suspected to be guilty of. With this they conclude their defense, verse, verse 29 God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord, as we own we should if we had set up this altar for burnt offerings, no, we abhor the thought of it. We have as great a value and veneration for the altar of the Lord at Shiloh as any of the tribes of Israel have, and are as firmly resolved to adhere to it and constantly to attend it. We have the same concern that you have for the purity of God's worship and the unity of His church, far be it, far be it from us, to think of turning away from following God. 2. They fully explain their true intent and meaning in building this altar, and we have all the reason in the world to believe that it is a true representation of their design, and not advanced now to palliate it afterwards, as we have reason to think that these same persons meant very honestly when they petitioned to have their lot on that side George. Jordan, though then also as was their unhappiness to be misunderstood even by Moses himself. In their vindication, they make it out that the building of this altar was so far from being a step towards a separation from their brethren, and from the altar of the Lord at Shiloh, that, on the contrary, it was really designed for a pledge and preservative of their communion with their brethren and with the altar of God, and a token of their resolution to do the service of the Lord before him, verse 27, and to continue to do so. 1. They gave an account of the fears they had lest, in process of time, their posterity, being seated at such a distance from the tabernacle, should be looked upon and treated as strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. Verse 24. It was for fear of this thing, and the word signifies a great perplexity and solicitude of mind which they were in, until they eased themselves by this expedient. As they were returning home, and we may suppose it was not thought of before, else they would have made Joshua acquainted with their purpose. Some of them in discourse started this matter, and the rest took the hint and represented to themselves and one another a very melancholy prospect of what might probably happen in after ages, that their children would be looked upon by the other tribes as having no interest in the altar of God and the sacrifices there offered. Now indeed they were owned as brethren and were as welcome at the tabernacle as any other of the tribes, but what if their children after them should be disowned? They, by reason of their distance, and the interposition of Jordan, which it was not easy at all times to pass and repass, could not be so numerous and constant in their attendance on the three yearly feasts as the other tribes, to make a continual claim to the privileges of Israelites, and would therefore be looked upon as inconsiderable members of their church, and by degrees would be rejected as not members of it at all. So shall your children, who in their pride will be apt to monopolize the privileges of the altar, make our children, who perhaps will not be so careful as they ought to be to keep hold of those privileges, cease from fearing the Lord. Note 1. 
Those that are cut off from public ordinances are likely to lose all religion and will by degrees cease from fearing the Lord. Though the form and profession of godliness are kept up by many without the life and power, power of it, yet the life and power of it will not long be kept up without the form and profession. You take away grace if you take away the means of grace. 2. Those who have themselves found the comfort and benefit of God's ordinances cannot but desire to preserve and perpetuate the entail of them upon their seed, and use all possible precautions that their children after them may not be made to cease from following the Lord, or be looked upon as having no part in Him. 2. The project they had to prevent this, verses 26-28. Therefore, to secure an interest in the altar of God to those who shall come after us, and to prove their title to it, we said, Let us build an altar, to be a witness between us and you that, having this copy of the altar in their custody, it might be produced as an evidence of their right to the pri privilege of the original. Every one that saw this altar, and observed that it was never used for sacrifice and offering, would inquire what was the meaning of it, and this answer would be given to that inquiry that it was built by those separate tribes in token of their communion with their brethren and their joint interest with them in the altar of the Lord. Christ is the great altar that sanctifies every gift, the best evidence of our interest in Him will be the pattern of His Spirit in our hearts and our conformity to Him. If we can produce this it will be a testimony for us that we have a part in the Lord and an earnest of our perseverance in following Him. 30 And when Phinehas has the priest, and the princes of the congregation and heads of the thousands of Israel which were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. 31 And Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest said unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because ye have not committed this trespass against the Lord, now ye have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. 32 And Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest, and the princes, returned from the children of Reuben, and from the children of Gad, out of the land of Gilead, unto the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and brought them word again. 33 And the thing pleased the children of Israel, and the children of Israel blessed God, and did not intend to go up against them in battle, to destroy the land wherein the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. 34 And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar Ed, for it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. We have here the good issue of this controversy, which, if there had not been on both sides a disposition to peace, as there was on both sides a zeal for God, might have been of ill consequence, for quarrels about religion, for want of wisdom and love, often prove the most fierce and most difficult to be accommodated. But these contending parties, when the matter was fairly stated and argued, were so happy as to understand one another very well, and so the difference was presently compromised. 1. The ambassadors were exceedingly pleased when the separate tribes had given in a protestation of the innocency of their intentions in building this altar. 1. The ambassadors did not call in question their sincerity in that protestation, did not say, you tell us you design it not for sacrifice and offering, but who can believe you? What security will you give us that it shall never be so used? No. Charity believes all things, hopes all things, believes and hopes the best, and is very loath to give the lie to any. 2. They did not upbraid them with the rashness and unadvisedness of this action, did not tell them, if you would do such a thing, and with this good intention, yet you might have had so much respect for Joshua and Eliezer as to have advised with them, or at least have made them acquainted with it and so have saved the trouble and expense of this embassy. But a little want of consideration and good manners should be excused and overlooked in those who, we have reason to think, mean honestly. 3. Much less did they go about to fish for evidence to make out their charge, because they had once exhibited it, but were glad to have their mistake rectified, and were not at all ashamed to own it. Proud and peevish spirits, when they have passed an unjust censure upon their brethren, though ever so much convincing evidence, evidence be brought of the injustice of it, will stand to it, and can by no means be persuaded to retract it. These ambassadors were not so prejudiced, their brethren's vindication pleased them, verse 30. They looked upon their innocency as a token of God's presence, verse 31, especially when they found that what was done was so far from being an indication of their growing cool to the altar of God that, one the contrary, it was a fruit of their zealous affection to it, you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord, that is, you have not, as we feared, delivered them into the hand of the Lord, 
or expose them to his judgments by the trespass we were jealous of. 2. The congregation was abundantly satisfied when their ambassadors reported to them their brethren's apology for what they had done. It should seem they stayed together, at least by their representatives, until they heard the issue, verse 32, and when they understood the truth of the matter it pleased them, verse 33, and they blessed God. Note, our brethren's constancy in religion, their zeal for the power of godliness, and their keeping the unity of the Spirit in faith and love, notwithstanding the jealousies conceived of them them as breaking the unity of the church, are things which we should be very glad to be satisfied of, and should make the matter both of our rejoicing and of our thanksgiving, let God have the glory of it, and let us take the comfort of it. Being thus satisfied, they laid down their arms immediately, and were so far from any thoughts of prosecuting the war they had been meditating against their brethren that we may suppose them wishing for the next feast, when they should meet them at Shiloh. 3. The separate tribes were gratified, and, since they had a mind to preserve among them this pattern of the altar of God, though there was not likely to be that occasion for it which they fancied, yet Joshua and the princes let them have their humor, and did not give orders for the demolishing of it, though there was as much reason to fear that it might in process of time be an occasion of idolatry, as there was to hope that ever it might be a preservation from idolatry. Thus did the strong bear the infirmities of the weak. Only care was taken that they having explained the meaning of their altar, that it was intended for no more than a testimony of their communion with the altar at Shiloh, this explanation should be recorded, which was done according to the usage of those times by giving a name to it signifying so much, verse 34, they called it Ed, a witness to that, and no more, a witness of the relation they stood into God and Israel, and of their concurrence with the rest of the tribes in the same common faith, that Jehovah he is God, he and no other. It was a witness to posterity of their care to transmit their religion pure and entire to them, and would be a witness against them if ever they should forsake God and turn from following after him.